we were just talking about the interrupts. So uh, when your application tries to connect to the uh, CD-ROM or hard drive or whatever I/O device and tries to read something, uh, at the time you uh, you put that process into a waiting list, waiting queue, and you switch your processor to something else, right? Just to keep it busy. That's the CPU scheduling stuff. When it's done we had to use some sort of signaling to let the CPU know hey I'm done with the file with the you know CD-ROM or hard drive which is that signal is called interrupts. Interrupts are used for many things not only for IO stuff but also for the kernel processes everything you know it's really complicated system the operating system itself is managing the memory, managing the CPU, managing uh, the operating system itself, right? A process, uh, processes itself, and uh, what else you're managing? You're managing the I/O system, right? What else? You manage the ports, USB ports, uh, whatever uh, HDMI ports, etc., etc. All those I/O devices are controlled by the operating system. Plus. Since almost all of the operating systems are network operating systems right now, even your personal Windows computer uh, is a multi-user network enabled operating system, right? That means you have tons of stuff about security, data protection, that is a part of the operating system too, so it has to be complex. I mean that oper operating system has to be complex. All right. There are two types of uh, interrupts. One is maskable. The other one is non-maskable. Maskable means uh, you can change its uh, priority or its place in the interrupt queue. You can change it. All right. As a user, your application can change it. But there are interrupts that you cannot touch which are non-maskable, all right? Those are for what kind of processes do you think? If you cannot mask an interrupt, if you cannot touch an interrupt, what kind of interrupt it could be? What kind of process should be assigned to this interrupt? Core programs, I guess? Yes, core programs, meaning kernel mode, uh, system calls and things like that, right? The operating system core applications like memory management, like CPU management interrupts. There is a diagram here talking about how can you handle an I.O. device roughly. Basically it's saying that you know in the CPU you're running a process and that process needs to uh, do an I request. In that case, you just uh, generate an interrupt. Tell the CPU that I need to go to and uh, you know talk to my I/O device and save the state of the PCB. Save it in the queue, and then uh, do something else in the meantime. After all, your interrupt will tell you that I am done with the I/O, and your CPU will reload that process and do whatever it's supposed to do with the uh, new data and finish it up and done for the next job. And interrupts are uh, saved in a list, as I was saying before, in a table. In that ta that table is called vector table. And the, the process and the uh, interrupt number is actually matched. And some of the uh, interrupts are non-maskable, as, as I said, which means you cannot touch. Those are system interrupts. Let's call it system interrupts, right? And uh, an example for that on the screen says Dwight error zero. Dwight by zero error, for example, interrupt zero. You can never change its priority and you can never change its, its place in the queue. You can't do that because it's very important. It's system-wise, right? For example, another one, another super important one is page fault number 14. Page fault is also virtual, me uh, virtual memory management, right? Uh, page management. So it is very important if you touch that as, as a user, if your application change anything in the system stacks, system data structures, it will be a problem. 
floating point errors, etc., etc. And after 32, up to 255, it's your interrupt stuff. I mean, if you write an application, your application use any interrupt numbers between 32 and 255. That's okay. Uh, we talked about that DMA stuff. Here's an example for that. Your CPU actually is bypassed by the DMA controller. As you see here, CPU memory bus it says. Um, here, as I said, DMA controller is a microcontroller. All right, uh, on the motherboard, separately installed, it is separate from the CPU itself. Okay, and that controller talks to the memory, the physical memory in your computer directly. All right, and uh, your device, in this case, your device is a disk, will have this uh, device driver which access to the DMA controller and just takes the CPU's cycles, uh, saves the CPU cycles and adds performance to your system. Alright, so let me sh show you this very shortly. Mm, draw it, I can, I'll try to draw something for you. Okay, here I have my device, I device, and I have the, this is physical device, right? And I had a device driver, this is an application, and attached to that now, my physical device is going to be attached to the operating system, but the operating system will have an interface before that. Interface for IO device. Well, the reason we are having this interface, you know, uh, we have different types of uh, IO devices. For each I device, we define our interface like the you know, like in the Java interfaces. We define methods like read, write, seek, and things like you know th th this kind of methods you write. For example, uh, you can have a method called pause in your interface, and with those do device drivers are written to match with your interface methods. All right, it is exactly the you know almost identical to those Java interfaces. You have you define as an operating system designer. You define your interface, and the manufacturer fills in the methods for you. All right, they will implement your interfaces in different ways. All right, but. Uh, whatever operating system you're working on you should have some sort of standardization right I mean some sort of standard all the operating systems should be agree designers should be agree so that the device uh, you know the manufacturers or the devices I devices can implement the same interface with different methods uh, code in it for different operating systems you know, if they write the uh, device driver for Macintosh, it should be almost a similar, you know, same, it should have the same um, interface implementation for Windows 2. The only difference between them, inside the methods, the code will change, but the methods, uh, method signature will stay the same, in general. I mean, this is something we're trying to accomplish in the market. You know, IEEE, ISO, things like that, they're working to standardize those kind of stuff, right? For example, when you talk about TCP IP, 
what do you think, you know, who defines the TCP? Who do you think it, the, uh, defines the TCP IP protocol itself? It's a protocol, right? But it must have a specification, right? You know, for example, uh, the bytes MTU, MTU values can be the, between these integer into ranges, or the handshake algorithm will be this and that, you know, those kind of stuff should be designed by someone should be specified by someone. TCP/IP is an open source uh, networking protocol, right? And um, if you don't follow some specifications, if you don't have any standardization, it's going to be a problem. So for those device drivers too, you know, you will have the interface kind of standard, so that you know you can write the different uh, drivers for different operating systems. And after the interface, you know, your uh, this. external world let's say um actually yeah and here you have your operating system all right once you define your interfaces with your operating system you don't have to add anything else for a new device on your operating system Right? You will not change your operating system for a new device. All you have to say to them, you know what, this the device looks like this one. I have the interface for that. So you can use this interface and write your device driver for, all, for that specific interface so that, you know, instead of recompiling my operating system, I will just take this driver, install it, it will just work, you know, seamlessly. But this interface is very important for the operating system designers. You know, that is why we say we have disks, we have tapes, we have network cards, we have, um, what else we have? Keyboards, we have mouse, you know, mice, whatever. You know, we categorize and generate a full list for the interface and every operating system designer uses the same list at least we're trying to make them use the same list all right that's what we are trying to do uh, this is the spe uh, general structure of the uh, io in the operating system for example this list on the on the screen right now it it, it is actually a um, uh, parameter list for the for the interface I was talking about for example in that interface some devices might have characters some will have blocks for example on, on your keyboard you pre press a uh, character on the keypad it will just send one single character but in the in case of hard drive it will read stuff and send stuff to the operating system block by block all right it could be uh, you know according to the size of the data it is transmitting it could be character stream or block for uh, if you're sending and receiving data from the or to that uh, io device it could be a sequential or random access the data you can get from the device you can get it sequentially or you can get it randomly for example, you're reading a backup data from a tape backup unit. It could be most likely sequentially, right? You, because you can just start from the beginning and then go through, right? In general, you cannot uh, go back and forward in a tape unit. Can you do that? You should do it, right? You just read it from the start till the end and get the information that is sequential synchronous or asynchronous or both uh, that means you don't really have to wait for it asynchronously you know or more like random access uh, style you don't have to wait for it but uh, for the synchronous one you have to wait for it you have to wait for the data coming from the IO device shareable or dedicated if it is shareable, I mean, these are like, you know, properties of a single I device, a generic I device. If it is shareable, you, uh, multiple processes can share this I device at the same time. If it is dedicated, 
no, they cannot. For example, your keyboard, your mouse can be shared, right? For multiple windows on the screen, you see you can move your mouse from the WinWord, uh, Word application to the file manager. All those processes can be activated by a left click, but some of the uh, IO devices cannot be shared at all. It has to be specific. For example, that network card you install in your desktop, you cannot share it. It is specifically uh, should be used by your printing system, not even with something else, uh, some other applications you have. But you know, web, uh, a web client, for example, is a good example for that. But it has to go through the operating system, anyways. Speed of the operation. Some devices are categorized according to their speeds, and uh, it's going to be a parameter for the interface too. Slow ones, you know, fast ones, super fast ones, you know. Some, uh, for example, USB 2.0 ports, and now we have 3.0 port, and we have, what is that, uh, port starts with an F, it's like Fi or something, you know about that port on your laptop, mm -hmm. yeah, it is Fi or something, it's a new type of port, I never used it anyway, so I don't know. And also, uh, devices could be read-only, like a random, uh, like a CD-ROM. Uh, you cannot write on the, on many CD-ROMs. If you buy an audio CD, right? You cannot write them on on them. You can just read, read, write, or write only. You know, believe it or not, some devices are write only. <laughs> You never read from them. What to write stuff on them? If you if you cannot read, what is the purpose writing on any kind of device like that? If nobody is reading, why are you writing at all? Someone else read? What's that? So someone else read it, or like a different reader can read. Alright, you're gonna keep that data into in that device, right? Yeah. But you never read it. Why is that? For example, think about a printer. You write to a printer, but you never read anything from a printer, right? You, whatever you write, it comes out as paper. Something like that. And this is the block diagram of this uh, system that I just draw. Actually, <laughs> there was no need to draw it, anyways. I guess there's this kernel, the operating system itself. You have the kernel I/O subsystem, which is another part of the kernel, deals with the I/O only. And you have drivers. These drivers are not a part of the operating system, right? It is. They are installed after it, after the operating system. You know, without those drivers, your operating system would continue working with no problem. But as in Windows case and uh, Linux too, we have some default drivers. For example, most of the uh, you know the uh, mouse wired or wireless, they will not need any driver at all. You just plug it; it will just work with no problem at all. Because you know. Uh, these are very common devices. Many people have them. You know, thousands, millions of people are using those kind of stuff. So, the operating system designers say, you know what? Since everybody is using, you know, like 80% of the, or almost 99.9% .9 of the uh, laptop users are using my mouse, let's put a mouse driver in it. So, you know, people will not cry aloud trying to download and, you know, install a mouse driver for that. Anyways, we have the drivers and we have the controllers. As you know, every physical device is a bunch of mechanics, electronics, so they really need a way of communication electronically. So they have the controller boards, PCBs. These are controller boards or microcontrollers with, the, with a f uh, firmware on it. 
And finally, we have the physical devices right here. A SCSI device, a keyboard, a mouse, PCI bus, etc. etc. This is the general structure, characteristics. Well, uh, again, uh, when you're designing your uh, interface uh, for the operating system, uh, inside the operating system for the I.O. devices, this could be another uh, set of uh, parameter that you should use. For example, what's gonna, uh, what kind of transfer mode you're going to use? Is it going to be uh, a block or a character? And uh, example for that terminal screen. Uh, terminal screen, you know, even in Macintosh you have one, right? In Windows you have this uh, black and white uh, commands prompt. You can actually change its color. <laughs> I always make it green and black. You know, it's like the Matrix style, huh? <laughs> I feel better. No, the truth is. In 1980s, uh, we had those uh, dump terminals, workstations, and they had like two or three options. The first option was green and black, the second one orange and black, believe it or not, and the other one was white and black. Black and white, in other words. <laughs> So uh, we had all these, uh, those green and black ones, and I like them very much. Anyways, um, device speed, I have direction, etc. Let me see if there's any other important stuff here. Okay, network devices. Okay, uh, when you're talking about hard drive, what kind of information your operating system or your application sends to your hard drive? Does it say, you know, I actually asked this question before when, it, when we were talking about processes. Do you think you're, you tell, okay, you're trying to open the test.txt file, right? Do you tell your hard drive to give you the test.txt file or you tell it, give me that block on that sector and track? You have two options, multiple choice. A, you just give the file name. B, you specifically give the location, the sector number and track number and things like that. A black block number, in short. A or B? Who tells A? One student here. Anybody on uh, always very A? You say A. No? A B in this case, the rest. Oh, some people say none of them. <laughs> wow, it's interesting. <laughs> well, in general, your operating system doesn't have any idea what is in your hard drive, what, what, which files are in your hard drive. All right? But it will have the idea when you first reach your hard drive and get the list of. That means that the file list should be in your somewhere in your hard drive. The file structure, sub uh, subfolders, folders. That remember that root structure, one level, two level directories. That tree, the sub the the, the folder structure has to be somewhere in your hard drive. In that case, you unplug your hard drive and go and plug it to some other computer, you will see the same structure, right? Nothing is gone. You have that same structure, same table, same director structure, because you got that table in your hard drive. That means your operating system just says, give me text test.txt uh, file. It just tells the file name. It doesn't have to say how to know anything about the blocks or anything. It will just say, give me the file. And then since the hard drive itself, itself has this controller uh, board, the PCB board, it has the, it has the ability to convert that file name to the blocks. And it will just read the blocks and then uh, push it into the operating system. You will get that data. For the network card, uh, 
uh, you can read right from the hard drive, right? But what are you going to do with the network card? Both of them are IO devices. Can you read from a network card? Can you write to a network card? Can you seek? Do you have a director structure in a network card? Well, many of the operations are not identical, but some of them are. You can actually read from a network card, right? How? It is called listening. You know, you can listen to a network port for a specific information. For example, you use your web client, your browser, to connect to nyit.edu. That data comes from the NYIT servers. You're actually listening your network card at port 80, right? You just listen to port 80, whatever comes, you show it on the screen, on your web client, uh, on your browser. That is called a socket, actually you can uh, reach to your network card through the sockets and it uses the port numbers all right so um, there's another IO uh, service let's say clocks and time timers your operating system has this ability it uses uh, crystals to, uh, and uh, digital integrated circuits to generate clocks, clock ticks. And those clock ticks are used uh, as a timer. You know, you set your timer to 10 milliseconds, and at the end, you spread a lot of interrupts everywhere, for example. All right, you can do that. Or just give me the system clock. Programmable interval timers, etc. Okay, this uh, difference, uh, differentiating between the blocking and non-blocking IO devices are important um, because some of the IO devices, you know, when you're in your Java uh, programming, you can use threads, right? Those threads will give you <coughs> parallel programming ability. You know, at the same time, you can do multiple things. <coughs> And if you have uh, more than one course, you can take advantage of the, uh, them. You know, you can boost up your application's performance. But some of uh, the IO devices will not work with your threading approach. Because whatever you do, you cannot access multiple times on that uh, IO device. Or when you ask for data from that specific IO device, you have to wait for the answer. All right, some of them are blocking your process, so you have to wait for the data, okay? But some of them are not actually blocking. You know, you don't have to wait for it because uh, it uses uh, something special called buffers inside it, and also a part of your main memory, your physical memory, can be used as a buffer. By the way, uh, you need to know about buffers and caches. You know, they're different things, and you should know the difference between them. I'll talk about it soon. Okay. On a non blocking IO device, you just tell, give me this, and then continue whatever you're doing. It will just read it. You know, it will not stop your uh, process as the blocking one does. It will just continue uh, working on the data. It will put it in a buffer, and then the, your process will read the buffer at the end, and it will just uh, continue working, continue executing. All right. Asynchronous or not, ex asynchronous pro, uh, I/O devices are not really used, used uh, because it's very um, hard to code you know if the implementation is hard for the developer it's most likely not going to be used all right oh uh, we need to talk about the caches buffers are like um, queues you remember data structure queues right queue is something that you put multiple things, data, process, whatever, objects in order and then start processing them from the beginning, all right, from the first one. That is a queue. So buffer is a copy of an original data. 
for example, um, you're sending 100 pages on uh, to your printer, and your printer's memory is two megabytes, and each page you're sending is two megabytes. What happens? You receive the first one, and you have to wait until it prints the other one, right? And then uh, once done, yeah, uh, your operating system will send the other one. And while it's waiting, where it really waits, I mean those uh, 20 megabytes, right? 18 megabytes of it will has to wait somewhere, uh, somewhere in the operating system, right? Somewhere in the in the system, in the computer, in the hard drive, in the memory. Where does it uh, wait? That's kind of, uh, it, it has to wait in the actual memory because you know it is being processed. You know, since it's being processed, you should always keep, uh, I mean the application will always keep that alive data on the memory uh, since in turn it will be processed. But some printers have uh, internal buffers. And it doesn't matter how many uh, files you're sending, it just keep, it keeps taking them. You know, it does. You know, it has a large. Some of them actually have hard drives. Some printers, you know, some copy Xerox copy machines, they have uh, hard drives. Believe it or not, they have an operating system too. Of course, you, know, you you're pressing those buttons. It's coming from somewhere, right? <laughs> I mean, seriously. Yeah, it has an embedded operating uh, computer and an operating system. Right? And what the, the files you're sending goes into the internal buffer. That means you're copying some stuff into some place, into some queue. That is buffering. Caching, however, is not copying. It's the original uh, data itself. You're just moving that data, not copying. You're moving that data into a cache, which is a super fast memory, right? It could be on the physical memory, but most likely it's going to be uh, one of the caches in the CPU, L1, L2 caches. All right, there's something wrong with this picture. On this part here, that kernel word is supposed to be right here. <laughs> and this is two I.O. methods, synchronous and asynchronous. Synchronous has to wait. All right. There's a request for the, uh, from the IO device, read or write or seek or listen, whatever. I mean, some sort of request from the IO device. And uh, of course, it's going to be taken care of by the device driver. And that device driver actually generates the interrupt. And then data transfer completes. But while these are uh, being done, this is the time, your process has to wait. All right, it starts here, works uh, his way out here. When it's ending, in the meantime, you can't do anything. You have to wait for it, all right? Well, actually, you can do something because you can just put the process in the waiting queue and then you can switch to another process uh, by using the CPU scheduling. But if your IO device is asynchronous, in that case, you don't have to wait for it. You just say, you know, give me that and then it will take care of it. It will just put it in a buffer and uh, you can actually continue running the same exact process, execute, continue executing. But that process must be able to go back and read the data from somewhere. You know, if you say, for example, you can write a read from hard drive method in two ways. First way, you can say, you know, give me this file, open that file, I will wait for it. The second way, give me that file, but I'm not going to wait for it, I'll do something else. But uh, 10 milliseconds later, I will come back and check if you have the file already or not. I will check the buffer, all right? That's another way. So this is the second one is asynchronous. You don't wait for it. You do something else in the meantime your process is doing something else you're not actually giving away your process and you know it will be put in the waiting queue or whatever but you yourself the the process itself uh, does something else in the meantime okay 
So that is called a synchronous. <laughs> This is a comparison for the transfer rates of different I uh, devices. Some examples, actually. Uh, if you look at this one, it starts is the here is zero, and which one is the fastest one is the system bus. And uh, actually, CPU itself is way faster than the system bus, but in this uh, diagram, they didn't somehow for some reason. They didn't include the memory and the CPU in this list because uh, I think they are trying to tell us, hey, system bus is the I.O. bus and the rest of the stuff I'm putting here is I.O. related. You know, CPU itself is, is not an I.O. device. All right, caching, spooling. Well, spooling is exactly the same thing we uh, spooled a service in, for your printer. I'll show you something. I don't know if you have, have seen this before or but um, how can I do that? Press this. <laughs> okay, go to your Windows computer if you have one laptop here right now. Uh, I don't know if I can see it here because of the restrictions of the system. But I'll try it anyway. As you see, my right click is not working. I hate you. Okay, try another way. And if that one is not working, maybe this one is gonna work. And probably not. Oh, really? This is crazy. See that? This is not a good thing. What I was trying to show you right here I do have system settings device manager no um, nope well you don't have the rights okay you cannot change but you can see it you know you can watch it but you can't touch it Okay, I was trying to show you. Oh. All right, let's one more try. Maybe I'll see it here. Ah, there you go. You see that print spooler? And there's actually another way to go through my computer and properties and the sort of services, etc. But this is a service running called Spooler in Windows. It's been the same for like the last 20 years. They use the same way. Uh, if you stop this print spooler service, you can actually, you know, uh, kill the service or stop the service, start, etc. You know, uh, if you stop it, you cannot print on the printer anymore even though you had the driver, you have the software, you have everything, but if your operating system spooler is not working, that means the queue is not working, the uh, queue manager, so you cannot really do anything. Anyway, spooler, spooling actually is a system, is, a, is an algorithm that we use to send data to IO devices like printers, all right? Caching is also another one. Uh, well, caching is copying, buffering is moving. Don't be confused. I think I, I said the, the opposite, I'm not sure. By the way, uh, when I was talking about the interrupts, I was saying that you, you know you had two types, masking and non-masking. Also, there are other ways to manage interrupts by changing their priorities. All right. For example, for system calls and system-related stuff, operating system-related, kernel mode-related processes, you can change the uh, well uh, the priority level is higher than the user mode processes because you know you have to take care of the house at first and then you take care of the you know the, the neighbors or whatever 
So the most important part is the operating system first and then the user uh, applications. So I need to say that error handling. Well, those interrupts are used for error handling too. If there's an error with your IO device, if you cannot read, if there's a bad block, for example, in your hard drive, what are you gonna do? If you cannot read it, you had to generate an error, right? You had to tell the operating system, hey, there's a problem, I can't read. You know, I can't keep trying this because it's broken. You know, he cannot push sometimes, he had to stop. All right, so that's, uh, those errors has to be handled by who? Okay, that's a real good question. In which box I should generate the error? I had a device. This is the physical thing. I mean, this is the printer, this is the hard drive, this is the CD, whatever. And this is actually the source of the error, right? This is the mechanical or electronical or whatever kind. I have an error. I can't do what I'm supposed to do. And that device is not responding. So this is a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, electronic parts and mechanics. It cannot talk to me. It cannot give me anything. It doesn't have a software or whatever. But this, well, we forgot something here, by the way. <laughs> What is this thing? Device controller. This is the you know PCB, the, the green thing. Anyways, and the device controller is also a bunch of electronics. It cannot talk to the operating system. Well, it's some in some ways it can, but it cannot really report an error, right? What do you think? Uh, should I go for the driver application? I'm sorry, the device driver, or should I go for the uh, controller? Which one? Or the operating system itself? Who is generating the error? And who is handling the error? Well, the device is generating the error itself, right? Uh, physical whatever, or electronics, some, some sort of uh, problem. This is the er source of the error. And actually, the device controller is uh, sending out some signals to the device driver because the dri device driver understands the language of the controller. That's the only thing that understands the device controller's language, right? And also, a device driver is capable of talking to the operating system's interface. So this guy is the most important one for me. Even though the device controller tells me, hey, there's an error here, I, can't, I have a bad block here uh, on the hard drive. Even that controller tells that, the, uh, the reporting person is a device driver. That is the uh, piece of application, piece of software. Uh, sends the required information to the operating system and operating system takes uh, care of it, right? And mo in most situations, the controller or the dri device driver will have some sort of trap to recover from the error. In the old days, for example, we had this application, external application to search through the hard drive and uh, mark the bad sectors on it, right? So you, you don't want to use it again and uh, lose your data. That we were using an external application for that. But in the latest hard drives right now, it is embedded into the controller. All right, that PCB at the back of the hard drive. It has a list, a flash drive, which uh, holds a list of the bad sectors in it, all right? So it never ever touches that bad sector so you will not uh, face any problems later on, okay? So let's go back and finish this up and then quickly go through the chapters, all chapters, uh, and I'll tell you which one is important. Yeah, we're approaching to the end of the class. So system call, kernel data structures. <coughs> In the moral of this story all about you know uh, the data structures uh, in the kernel, kernel data structures for each specific I/O device. As you know, already know, 
we have the interfaces for each type of IO devices in the uh, kernel IO subsystem and according to the uh, type of the uh, IO device we also have data structures built in in the kernel so we can use those data structures which are attached to the interface for IO uh, you know for each IO device type and uh, it's going to be faster to uh, communicate with those. For example, if you're talking about a file, it's, a, it's an I.O., right? It's an I.O. device. You know, uh, a file could be in a hard drive, in a CD, in a flash bell, uh, you know, uh, flash memory stick, etc. But at the end, it is a file, right? You have a structure for a file, and uh, you have a system call for it. In your, in your language, for example, programming language, you have uh, methods, functions that cause those system calls at the background. So it will actually utilize those data structures built in, in the kernel. We're just saying that, hey, there's something like that and use it, you know. Alright. It's a flowchart of an IO request. Flowcharts are used uh, for algorithm design in your programming, maybe you saw them, you know, start, yes or no, uh, generate if-then-else structure with diamonds, etc. UML 2.0, this is something like that. Uh, you don't have to worry about this one. Uh, we talked about those streams. The number one problem with the IO device, actually what we are really trying to do with the, any, any types of I, I, IO device, we are trying to match the speed of it with the CPU and the memory and try to run our application uh, properly and accurately. That's what we are trying to do. Uh, sometimes you can keep the CPU uh, utilization high, very high, Sometimes your IO will take yeah, a lot of uh, you know time. Uh, the CPU has to, will have to wait for a long time, but at the same time, IO will do a lot of jobs, etc. But overall, uh, the operating system design principle tells us that we need to minimize every operation. We have to make everything fast enough. So when there's a load, everything, the overall performance of the operating system will uh, be really uh, actually nominal. This is a long way of saying uh, this diagram talks about what's going on if you're try when you're trying to do an IO call in the operating system from scratch. You know, on the keyboard, you, uh, you type a character. After that, what really happens? It's a long way actually, but you know, um, let's go through. There's your keyboard, you to pr print on a character, and then there's an interrupt generated by the keyboard saying, that, Hey, someone printed on something, or when you move your mouse, Hey, someone is moving something. Maybe it, the user is trying to say something, <laughs> you know, the user is trying to do something. What should I do now? You know, you should take care of the user. User, you know, customer is always right, <laughs> anyways. And then you, your interrupt will be handled by the operating system. Uh, but, but first, it's going to go through the driver, right? Device driver. And uh, the kernel will take care of the system calls because it's an IO device. Uh, using the interface, it will uh, run the device driver methods. And then finally, what are we, uh, it's going to create a p uh, process. Oh, by the way, this is actually between the uh, remote computers. You know, you type something on the terminal, it shows up on the other side. What really happens here, this is uh, talking about that. It's not only the generic I.O. device messaging or the workflow. It is also about the remote uh, I.O. device messaging. Let's forget about that. Same thing, uh, uh, doubled on the other side. But one side is server, one side is clients, by the way. It's a little bit different, I mean. 
what can you do to improve your I.O. device management performance? You can reduce the number of, you should actually, reduce the number of context switches. You remember what was it, context switch? Come on, you can do it. It sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's a part of CPU scheduling. All right, what do you do when you put a process into a waiting queue or after putting a process into a waiting queue, what do, what do you do? You switch to another process. That is context switch. <laughs> so if you reduce the number of context switches, that means you're saving a lot of you know CPU cycles. Uh, while you, uh, someone I was asking about BIOS programming here, he was you right? Yeah. Um, and I was saying that if you you know as a device driver uh, developer, you can find you know. Uh, you can find a good job, they will pay you a lot of money because not many people are writing device drivers. If you write your dri uh, device driver yourself, in that case, or if you're a you know, professional uh, programmer, you should uh, try to reduce your, uh, the number of the context switches in your device driver, okay? That means you're gonna use threads, that means you're gonna use, uh, you're gonna handle your IO device properly, which will not cause your process to be put in a wait list. All right, that's what uh, it means. Reduce uh, data copying. Instead of copying, just move it, try to move it. Uh, and data copying actually is a problem when you're copying a lot of data, you know, or when you're moving or copying large amount of data, it's a problem. So if you want to do it, if you had to do it, do it uh, efficiently in a way. Reduce interrupts by using large transfers, smart controllers, polling. Use other technic techniques or algorithms to reduce interrupt, number of interrupts uh, in a unit time. Use DMA, it says, and uh, mapped memories. Uh, instead of using the CPU all the time, use the DMA controller if it, pos uh, if it is possible. But as I said, using the DMA ex uh, excessively uh, will generate a lot of security problems. All right, use smarter hardware devices. <laughs> what does it mean? What do you think it means? Use smarter hardware devices to improve I/O device performance. What does it mean? What could, uh, po what it could be possibly about being smart or dumb on uh, as a hardware? And when do you call a hard disk if it is smart or dumb? For example, what's that? <laughs> as I said, um, I don't know if I said. It. To you, but um, I bought a hard drive which is a hybrid. It's a SSD plus uh, magnetic disk, 1.5 terabytes, and its uh, SSD part is only eight gigabytes, but the other part is uh, you know ter uh, terabytes. It is called a smart hard drive, but if you have it, uh, you know. A magnetic drive only. Let's call this dump drive. What do you think? Why we are calling the other one smart? Because it's uh, Not only that. How is possible to make it? Uh, you know, how can you make a hard drive faster with an SD, SSD or some other technologies? Well, you're actually using uh, statistics algorithms selective uh, data processing, let's say. Here, uh, what happens with the SSD hybrid? You know, as a user, you, re, uh, you are using some files, right? In your hard drive, after a while, let's say um, two hours later, your hard drive uh, t uh, makes a table for each file, says, you know, this file is reached, read, 
two times. This file is read ten times. This file is read one time. This file is read ne never. It was not uh, read at all. And this one was uh, read and modified, etc. There's this huge table, and then according to that table, it says you know statistically the user will probably use this file in the next two hours too. So you know what? Uh, let's move this file to the SSD part of the drive. And SSD part is uh, faster than the you know magnetic disk. And the next time you reach that file, it's going to be f way faster. So it is um, uh, for um, not only for the user files, by the way, for the operating system files too. Many other operating system files are actually read many times, right? During the operation, uh, you know, when you, when it's running, when your operating uh, computer is running, but. For that very reason, actually, your operating system has loaded them up to the memory, the physical memory already. So there's no need to read them multiple times, right? It will just read it once when you boot up your computer, put everything on the memory, right? And then um, the other files will be read, you know, multiple times from the hard drive. So this drive is smart because it is using algorithms to make the system faster while it's not really fast all right it's making this virtual given this virtual um, sense that it is really fast but it's not really you know it's just, it's just using this eight gigabytes of uh, fast parts to tell you that oh I have a 1.5 terabyte hard drive which is super fast but it's just 8 gigabytes in general you know in reality that means you know if you use smarter hardware devices like this one your IO improve uh, IO performance is gonna improve uh, good enough for you and for your company balance CPU memory bus and IO performance for highest throughput you know, the number one uh, purpose of uh, the whole operating <coughs> system is <coughs> keep the CPU utilized as much as possible you can, use the memory efficiently, and uh, use the I.O. efficiently so that, you know, the user will not complain. The operating system itself will not complain about speed or whatever. And if it's a, you know, uh, mission critical real-time system, um, it will do the job on time. That's the whole idea, or whole purpose, right? Balance everything. Move user mode process daemons to kernel threads. All right, if it's possible, if you have multi cores, uh, that is really good for you to use threads. And if you can program your application using threads, you will utilize most of the CPUs. That's what it is. Oh my gosh, it's the end of the game. All right, um, let's go for uh, review. You want to give a short break before the review, or you want to just jump in it and see what we can do about that? You know, the plan is I'm going to start from chapter 1 to chapter 13. And if you remember, we have sw uh, skipped chapter 6, 7, and 8. Yeah. So I will just, what I will do, I will just open up chapter and then go through the uh, slides. I'll tell you, hey, he <laughs> what? what? Oh, that's crazy, right? And uh, I'll just say, you know, in, in this slide, in this part, uh, you should know about this. Uh, you should know about this or don't care very much about this part, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I'll gi just give you hints. All right, from chapter one to 13, uh, let's give a short break, it's 3.11, it's more than one hour we have been talking. I have been talking. <laughs> so, you got your break for 10 minutes.